and we're back with some more oxygen not included. And today we're going to be having a look at nuclear reactors. How to set them up, how to fuel them, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of them. Now this may look like a little bit of an unusual reactor because your first instinct when you go to make one of these is you're going to make something like this with, you know, a bunch of stream, steam turbines strapped on top. You won't build enough and the reactor will explode. That's pretty much what they want you to do. But... First off, we've got to start off with the uh, the fuel for these things, which is enriched uranium. And enriched uranium, there's, well, realistically about three ways you're going to get your hands on it. The first is uranium centrifuge, the second is to use bees to mine the ore directly, and then there is the third option, which is where you feed the ore to the bees yourself. All of them, though, produce different yields. In this instance, we've got 100 kilos of uranium ore over here, another 100 kilos of uranium ore over here, and another 100 kilos there. Now, what we're going to do is we're just going to dig that tile out, turning it into uranium ore, which will drop to the ground. That will mean that these bee tinies over here are going to go have a go at uh, picking it up and dumping it into the beehive. Let's just fast forward a bit and see how long it takes them to get around to it. All right, Lincoln, you missed it there, but uh, all of them decided to go with the one time, well, two of them did. And those two of those bees, they just jumped 20 kilos of, well, 10 kilos each of uranium ore. And now the beta hive is turning that uranium ore into enriched uranium. It's going to take a while. It's got to actually do all the processing. But once this processing is finished, all of that or 90% of that uranium ore will have been converted to enriched uranium. It's a 90% efficient process. However, do note, we had to dig out that material. And when we dug it out, we lost half the mass. So we actually reduced our 100 kilos of uranium ore to 50 kilos of uranium ore and now only 90% of that is going to be converted to enriched uranium on the other end. So it's not exactly a perfect conversion process. In fact, let's see here, how much have we got left? We've got 30 kilos of uranium ore left and we've got 18 kilos of enriched uranium from the 20 kilos that already went in. This over here is a special one. If we delete that door there, or we could have just opened it, I suppose, what will happen is the bees now have access to the uranium ore directly. And what they can do is they will pick up, a, they will mine this directly from here and bring it to the hives. You don't have to dig anything out or do anything. So long as they've got access to a uranium ore tile, they'll dig it out. However, they don't lose any mass. When we dig up this 100 kilos over here, we instantly have destroyed half of it and running left with 50 kilos. They will dig it out one kilo at a time, no mass lost, bring it straight back to the beta hive. And when they're finished with this, we'll have converted, oh, there they go. They've just dumped in, I think it was about three kilos or did I misread that? Yeah, no, three kilos. They'll only do it one kilo at a time, though. They won't do it ten kilos at a time, like the bees over here that are dealing directly with the uh, the ore on the ground. They will only do it one kilo at a time. So they're a lot slower this way, but they're a lot, a lot more efficient. You can convert 90% of the uranium into enriched uranium this way. It's incredibly efficient. Now, over here, we have the uranium centrifuge. This is the least efficient of the lot. In fact, it's, it's pretty horrendous. We've just summoned in Abe here. They're going to grab some uranium ore. They're going to dump it in there. And it takes 10 kilos of uranium ore and converts it to 2 kilos of enriched uranium. Yes, that's the 20% efficient process. In fact, even less because you remember you lost half the mass from you were digging it up. So it's more like a 10% efficient process. For every 100 kilos of uranium ore you feed into one of these, well, 100 kilos of uranium ore, you dig it out and then you feed it to this, you'll end up with 10 kilos of enriched uranium at the end. Uh, as well as that, it does give you one byproduct and that is... In, oh, where is it? Yeah, this stuff is uranium liquid. I haven't really found much of a use for this, but it is useful in one respect. It has a freeze point of 132.9 C, or it freezes at a, well, quite a quite a high temperature. And as well as that, it has a vaporization point really, really high. So you can put this into a metal refinery and use it to heat up stuff to like 4,000 degrees. It'll allow you to melt most metals if you want. So it is useful for sticking into a uranium refinery, though. Or a metal refinery, though. Honestly, I haven't really played around with it too much, and I wouldn't be bothered because this is a very inefficient way of making uranium. The ref enriched uranium refinery here, the uranium centrifuge, is just about finished, and you'll notice there's 8 kilos on the ground, and it's going to spit out another 2 kilos there in a minute. This thing is actually automated, so you don't have to have any duplicates interact as well. Once the ore is delivered, it just does everything on its own. But you ended up with uh, 10 kilos of enriched uranium for all your effort. And over here, we have 45 kilos of enriched uranium for the exact same amount of uranium ore. And over here, it's still going. All we've got is, what, uh, 5.4 kilos. So this is definitely faster than using this method but it's slower than using this method, and this method's more efficient. So worst case scenario, I would advise you to use this method. It allows you to refine a lot of uranium very quickly, and it doesn't require you to have an awful lot of bees. However, that, you know, might not be viable for you. So here's another option you can do is to expand this section out. It's actually rather easy. What we'll do is we'll open these doors here. Now what happens is these little bee tinies, they are 
unique. There's a little bit of a unique section of how these things replicate. What these bee tinies do is they want... Where are you going? What? Oh, never mind. These bee tinies, when they hit 2.5 years of age... Let's find the oldest one here. Where are you? Oh, never mind. This one's the oldest one. When they hit 2.5 years of age, they have a look in their surrounding tiles. If in their surrounding tiles they can see another beta hive, they will go, Oh, there's a beta hive here. I will turn into a bee. However, if they can't see a beta hive, what they will do is they will turn into a beta hive. Their job is to either turn into a bee if there's a hive nearby so that they can feed the hive, or if there is no hive nearby, they turn directly into a hive. Few things to note about these uh, exceptional little critters is they consume carbon dioxide if it's anywhere near them, but it does knock them out. So if there's any carbon dioxide nearby, they're effectively useless. It, it, I think they meant this as a way to anesthetize the bees, but realistically you never use it. In fact, you just want to keep all the gases away from them. As well as that, their survival temperature range is pretty horrible. It's like minus, or was it uh, zero degrees to minus 100? So you've got to keep them in cold temperatures, sub-zero temperatures, or they will die. You don't really have a choice in that. Kind of unfortunate. Now let's skip this forward a bit and see what happens. If we've done this right, it should hopefully stop in between one of these doors and turn into a hive. This is a handy way to expand your population. And there we go, we've got ourselves a beta hive. Now, the reason I left all these doors like this is it's just a nice way to automatically expand your your farming. You leave them like this, you just build all the doors, and eventually they'll stop in between each alcove and form another hive. Uh, for the time being, though, you notice their pathing is absolutely horrendous. Uh, they haven't actually gone over to this uranium ore at all. It's also one of the reasons you want to keep expanding out rapidly. It's unfortunate, but their AI is absolutely horrendously dumb, and you're better off just building lots and lots of beta hives. Uh, you'll notice... Oh, there, we got a second one. There's another bee hive showing up. Now, you'll notice this thing just basically spawns a, a bee tiny every, once a cycle. So once a cycle, it spits out a bee. In fact, is it on its birthday? No way to find its birthday. Never mind. But yeah, it spits out a bee tiny once every five, once a, once a cycle. And these things only live for five cycles. So whether it turns into a bee or not, you can only ever really have four to five of these uh, bee things running around. And when they die, they drop nuclear waste. It's another way to get nuclear waste. I believe they drop a kilo. Every, every one of them drops a kilo when they die. Here are some hives we made earlier. Uh, these hives, as you can see, have spread out quite nicely. In fact, this entire area used to be hives, and we slowly sort of, well, they consumed all the uranium ore in the area. It's all pretty much gone. In fact, now they've even started eating out the uranium underneath the hives. Now, I wouldn't advise you to think of this as a high-speed way of producing them. It's more, well, they will produce it way faster than you need them. Usually about three of these should be able to run two reactors for you. But I like to have a few more just in case because they do bug out occasionally on boot up and they can end up not harvesting uranium sometimes. As well as that, it's possible for them to starve to death. If they don't get any uranium for long enough, the hives will literally just, just die. They'll die of starvation. Though that is unlikely to happen if you've got uranium around. Now, don't worry, if they do disintegrate or die, the enriched uranium inside them is not lost, it simply just drops to the ground. It's almost like an auto-harvest feature. As well as that, you can actually store a huge amount of enriched uranium in them. Uh, I think there's one over here that's pretty full. What's it up to? It's got about 2.2 tonnes of enriched uranium in it. I've seen ones go as high as 7 tonnes of enriched uranium, so as far as I can tell, there's no limit to how much enriched uranium they can store, so you're not in any rush to harvest them. Namely, what I would do would be run these for a while, get as much uranium as I need to run reactors comfortably. We'll go over the numbers later, but I've got about enough here to run two reactors for a thousand cycles. So I'm in no rush to go harvest that uranium over there. To harvest the uranium, do not send in dupes with no exosuit atmos suits on. The, these dupes, or these bees, will sting dupes if they come anywhere near them. Unless the dupes are wearing either atmo suits or radiation suits, one or the other. Doesn't matter which type, so long as they're wearing some sort of suit, the bees won't touch them. Oh. Except for one thing, I don't know if they've patched it out, but it used to be when you loaded up the game, and if your dupe was in range of the bees, even if they were wearing an atmos suit, they would get attacked by all the bees and killed. Well, stung to unconsciousness. It just seems that on load up, they don't seem to uh, ignore them, ignore atmos suit wearing dupes. That may have been patched since I haven't gone in with the bees in a while. So you now have enriched uranium and you want to start running a reactor. Well, the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to start researching because that stuff is pretty far down the track. It is right there. And you notice everything that's highlighted in yellow, that's what you need. You need to research all of that stuff before you have a chance of doing it. And one of the things you need to research this, it's going to be one of the first times you come around to it, is orbital research. And orbital research is uh, requires rockets. So let's just say it'll be a while before you get around to this. Not easy, but we're going to have a quick run over the, some of the reasons this reactor is the way it is before we go into the, the startup procedure, because the startup procedure and the way the reactor ends up are sort of inextricably intertwined. Okay, first things first. How does this thing run? 
And if you look in here, you'll see there's this enriched uranium, 59 to 60 kilos. It'll actually oscillate back and forth. You'll see it here being slowly consumed or, uh, I don't know if consumption is the right word, but uh, there we go, it's popped back up to 60 kilos again. What this is, is this is the heat source. As it is consumed, it generates heat, which heats up the enriched uranium and also heats up the 30 kilos of water that's in it. This runs on 30 kilo water packets. Now, once that 30 kilos of water hits 400 degrees, and there we go, it's hit 400 degrees. Where'd it go? Ah, here it is. Do you see that there? That right there is a blob of 400 degree water. 30 kilos of 400 degree water has fallen out of that reactor, and now it's falling straight down, all the way down here. And that is heat. And the thing is, that water doesn't actually interact with anything on the way down, so none of that heat is actually dispersed there. All the heat saves up until it hits this point. This is the central core point of the reactor. This is where all the heat goes. Everything goes in right here. That's very important. As well as that, that water can't be ejected if the steam pressure around it is more than 100 kilos. If there's 100 kilos of pressure or more around this reactor, that water can't eject, and the whole thing will go kablooey. At the same time, it also gives off nuclear waste, and that nuclear waste is down here. Hence, we have this liquid pump down here. If that liquid pump was there, the nuclear wasn't there, the nuclear waste would eventually stockpile up too much and we'd have problems. Now, with all of that out of the way, this gives you a very nice little stable reactor here. You'll see here it's about 200 degrees in temperature all the way across, which is the maximum temperature you can have in here, and keep the steam turbines working at optimum efficiency. If you go above 250 degrees, the steam turbines basically waste the heat. So it's wasted heat if you go above that. This whole thing generates about 8 kilowatts of power. Should generate, well, in theory you could generate 8.5 with all these steam turbines, but you can't. There's not actually enough heat given off by this research reactor. As well as that, it does have to provide cooling to the steam turbines. These steam turbines produce heat, and that heat is given off at the top of the, the steam turbines. So 10% of the heat that's destroyed has to be given off by the steam turbines, which means you also need to destroy that heat, which is where this aqua tuner comes in. This aqua tuner is running nuclear waste through it. This nuclear waste coolant loop is completely necessary. The reason being is if you try and use water or any other material, there's only two materials that you can get away with here, nuclear waste and supercoolant, because if you use anything else, you'll need two aqua tuners. So if you want to get away with just using one aqua tuner, nuclear waste it first, and then upgrade to supercoolant later on, unless you already have supercoolant lying around, in which case, congrats. Why is why are we putting the research reactor on top? It seems really counterintuitive, considering it's a heat source, steam goes up, that type of thing. Well, it's to do with the usage of the reactor itself as well. You see, this reactor gives off radiation, and you want to use that radiation, either to create rad bolts or to run farms, anything like that. And the problem is, if you place it down in a hole like this, you still have to put in a water pump, and you have to put in an aqua tuner, which means the space right beside it, where it gives off the most radiation, is already occupied. And the space below it, you'll probably have to put in mesh tiles to collect that nuclear waste, and you end up with not a lot of space, not being able to get very close to the reactor. However, if you build your design this way, you end up with this side over here where you can totally get lots of rads, it's 157, blah, 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 all the way along. And over here, it's actually pretty good as well. Now, on top, you can also stick on what some. So you can basically place your farms all the way around the reactor or whatever you want to collect radiation. You could also put a rad bolt generator in here and fire the, the bolts out diagonally. There's ways of doing that, so that's also a possibility. And there's a few other nice little design changes you could make if you really wanted to take advantage of the rads. Here is one we made earlier, and a couple of key features to go over before we start this up, because they were all intentional. One is down here, there is six tiles of space. And all six tiles of space are filled with water. That is six tons of water right there. We need that to, uh, well, we don't want to overpressurize this and we don't want to overpressure, underpressurize this reactor. So six tons of water is fine. You could go with a little bit more, a little bit less, but six tons seems like a good number and it fits in nice and conveniently down here. Secondly, this hydro sensor is turned off. Well, it's set to above 2000 kilos, which can't happen. We don't want any pumping to go on. And all of that is going to be fed, all that nuclear waste is initially going to be fed into our cooling loop, which is currently empty, which is not good. In fact, I will uh, disable, dis sever that. That's where our, our nuclear waste is going to go once this loop is full. And now it's time to hook this sucker up. So we'll get the liquid bridge, we'll chuck it on there, boom, that's just to fill up the system. It only holds about 30 kilos of water, but uh, it usually does keep some in reserve. Then once that's finished, we will mine that out. That drops the enriched uranium. Yes, I know we're... we're chunking some stuff in here. Oh, and one last thing. I've got these uh, steam turbines in vacuum, so to cool them, what you can do is use a liquid. Now, you can keep them in gas if you want, but this thing's going to be running at 45C. Sorry, 45. So, uh, I, I would prefer to keep it in a vacuum, maybe, and just use liquids to cool it. Or if you want to heat up the gases, that's fine. Just maybe insulate your base with them, because it's going to get pretty toasty in here. I'm just going to magic in 200 kilos of petroleum on each of these. Bottle emptiers spit out 200 kilos of liquid at a time. So, if you're trying to do this, just stick a bottle emptier right there. Then, make sure you've got plenty of petroleum, and they'll bring along 200 kilos and dump it off. One load is sufficient. Any more, you could potentially flood the steam turbines. Any less, it mightn't spread out the whole way. And with that done, we can start to see this fire up. 
Now that's going to take all of its liquid and drop it right down there into the center. All of the cooling that we actually have provided is also going to drop straight down there and into the center. And over here, this is where our water comes in initially, but once these steam tur turbines start running, they're going to start providing the water to this. That will stop us feeding any more water into the system. If you keep feeding water into the system, eventually it's going to get so pressurized in here that the research reactor will overpressurize at over 100 kilos and then the whole thing will go boom. So we're just depending on the recycled water coming out of these steam turbines to keep refilling up the reactor. Though maybe keep this around for a while, especially if it's your first reactor, just to make sure. It has been about a quarter of a cycle. We can already see that's starting to get a bit steamy. What's the water up to? Ah, uh, 90 degrees. We just got to wait till it hits 150. Uh, at that point, it will start getting processed by the steam turbines, but we will have no cooling for them. So the steam turbines are going to quickly start warming up unless we're careful. Oh, and there goes our first steam turbines today kicking in and out just as that heat kicks off. Oh, I completely forgot as well. Temperature shift plate made of diamond right about there is good, or any semi reasonably conductive material should do. That's just to help spread out that heat. We have got several of the steam turbines running right about now, so what we want to do is start getting them cooled because they're slowly going up in temperature. You can see that one's 46.8, 46.9. Yeah, they're, they're getting warmer. So we're going to turn this on, and that's going to start pumping that nuclear waste. And the nuclear waste is going to go up here. It can't get out there, remember? So it's going to get sent straight up here and across onto the cooling loop. Of course, it's boiling hot. It's 200 degrees. So it's not going to be cooling down the steam turbines to start. It's going to be yes, overheating them so they don't work. However, it'll come back down here. It'll go through the aquatuner loop, and it will start getting cooled down. There's going to be a little bit of uh, inefficiency here at the start, let's just say. However, since we have enough pressure in here and we've got a bit of time and it's early enough in the reactor's life cycle, it's not going to overheat anytime soon. So we should be good for a while longer. Now we're just going to let this run until we actually get down to cooling it to a point where it's useful again. 106 degrees, no. It's going to be probably about another cycle or so before this is solid. And there, the nuclear waste is starting to come out at 95, 94. Yeah, so it's slowly starting to cool, those, cool down those steam turbines up there. Soon the waste coming out of here should be below about 100 degrees. Yeah, you can also see the other steam turbines are starting to kick back in again. So we now have cooling and, oh, overheat damage. How did that happen? Yeah, maybe I was a little bit slow kicking that off. All right, with that done, what we can do is we can now change this back to with the settings it should be at, which is if this goes above 500 kilos, I want you to activate. Uh, that should take a while before that needs to do anything. And then we will, actually, we're not going to sever that. We are going to connect that pipe up there. Boom, all the nuclear waste can get sent up to our nuclear waste disposal area. All right, let's let this stabilize for a bit. It's going to take a while before this thing finds its equilibrium. The reason being is that aqua tuner is going to be running flat out for a while. That nuclear waste is only down to about 80 degrees. It's going to need to cool that all the way down to 45 before it shuts off. Up until then, this, yeah, it's going to be a little bit warm in here, a little bit over 200 degrees. And there we go. The whole reactor is pretty stable right about now. This thing is kicking on and off occasionally as it catches up with the, uh, the actual super coolant or the, the nuclear waste going through it. And the steam turbine here is looking at about 830 to 850. It's pretty close to perfection. And the temperature in here is just hovering below 200 C, which is exactly where we want it. Anything above 200 C is a waste, remember, so this is just about nice. Now, there is other things you can do. For example, you can block ports on steam turbines here. And by blocking multiple ports, then it will eat hotter steam without being as inefficient. But uh, just think of it this way. For every uh, amount of energy you eat, you get the exact same amount of uh, power out of this. It doesn't really matter if you block the ports or not. You're still going to need to run the same amount of steam turbines to generate the same amount of power and to consume the same amount of heat. There's like about a 1% to 2% inefficiency or efficiency gain depending on what way the, the, the numbers round up or round down. So honestly, I don't find it worth it to block the ports on these. I haven't really found a scenario where it's viable or really useful. As it is, just chuck down 10 steam turbines and you're good. You note this one's not really, you know, going flat out, but if we only go with nine steam turbines, we have a little bit of a problem, and it runs at about 207 degrees as opposed to 200 degrees. Now, tasty as this eight kilowatts of power is, there is some downsides. One, you can't really shut it off very easily. There's an automation port on this, but if you try and turn it off via the automation port, that's actually a fuel delivery control, so it disables fuel delivery. You'll have to wait until the fuel inside it runs out, and you'll have to prevent your dupes from automatically filling it. And if we'll check here, it's got 60 kilos right here, which is six days. It will run for six cycles just on that alone. And then we've got another 12 days of enriched uranium in there. So, yeah, 18 days. So if you have an emergency and you want to turn it off, you're going to have to wait 18 days until it stops running. Bit of a problem. Right now, you can still deconstruct it so the dupes can just run up, start deconstructing it. And if you have an emergency, you can turn it off in a reasonable time frame. However, what if you want to do power control so that you're not, you know, constantly running this and maybe have an on-off type of system? Well, yes and no. You're going to pay the price for that one. Now, over here, we have a very simple system. What this has is a, a little conveyor meter up here that measures out uranium, and basically, once a cycle, 10 kilos of uranium is dropped here. 
This reactor eats 10 kilos of uranium every cycle, so and at some point it will hit, it'll, just as it gets to zero, 10 more kilos will drop and 10 more kilos will fill it up. However, now this is, um, hmm, this is where things get a little bit awkward. You'll notice here that this has got 9.2 kilos of enriched uranium that's heating up, and my theory is, is that this doesn't generate as much heat as this one over here because this one is 60 kilos and it's heating up the same amount but because there's more mass it, it gives off more heat and this is producing less heat which would explain why this thing is only producing 2500 watts as opposed to the 8000 we're getting over here we're getting 2500 over here that's a massive decrease and the reason for that is well as far as i can tell we're feeding it less uranium it, these both of these reactors are running flat out they're both producing the same amount of nuclear waste it's just this does not generate as much heat However, this does give us a control on the reactor. Once a day, we can turn it off. We cannot refill it, and this thing can be shut off well, once a day. It does give us, and also as well as that, we don't need nearly as much of this junk here. We can make this a much smaller, more tightly controlled reactor. Basically, we can make a micro-reactor for some of our smaller colonies. This here is a micro-reactor we made earlier. You see, it's got only four steam turbines because this thing is only a, a turn-on, turn-off sort of system. And for this one here, we just have a storage bin with 10 kilos of uranium and uh, a very simple flip system. If the uh, temperature in here is above 800 degrees, this thing, or 180, yeah, it doesn't request any more uranium and it just leaves it off. If the temperature dips below 180, then we stick in some more uranium and go for another day. This allows us to, well, basically run a decent sized power brick on a foreign planet. The thing is, with the changes to solar that's come in, you can't just depend on solar anymore. It used to be you could just cover the top of the map in solar panels and you'd have plenty of power for your whole base. But unfortunately, yeah, that may not be possible anymore. So when it comes to generating power on another planet, you can either start tapping into the natural resources or if they don't have any, this is the most cost efficient power source you can send to another planet. Uh, for example, look at a petroleum generator. A petroleum generator produces two kilowatts of power. This produces 2.5, remember? So a petroleum generator, which uses less power, requires two kilos of petroleum per second per second. That means that you would need 1,200 kilos of petroleum to keep that generator running for a single day. Whereas this, assuming you're running it all flat out, with 1,200 kilos you would get, uh, yeah, that's 12 days. It would run for 12 days. So you can get 12 times as much longevity out of the uranium. As well as that, none of this is really wasted. If th these steam turbines only turn on when they're actually required. Now I'll just do a brief go through this because uh, honestly this gets uh, kind of confusing. Uh, ignore that second aqua tuner, that's for something else entirely. So, same thing again, we've got uh, aqua tuner down here, it runs a cooling loop up through, well, a whole bunch of things, and that's running super coolant, so it's all nice and chill and keeps the steam turbines down. Uh, the rest is all the same, except we've got a thermal sensor right here. Now, the thermal sensor's job is just to detect when the temperature goes uh, below 180. When it goes below 180, and this timer hits uh, 10 seconds of the day, then it sends a signal that goes, hey, it, it's too cold in here, dump in some more uranium. And then once the uranium's dumped in, it turns off again, and this uh, tops back up the storage bin, and it just keeps cycling back and forth as necessary when we need uranium. I will include this save game file if you want to have a play around with it. And uh, this allows you to use nuclear power pretty much anywhere. In fact, I was originally not a big fan of nuclear. For me, nuclear power seemed, uh, well, you could get a petroleum generator much earlier on and further down the tech tree. So why bother going this route? Well, lots of reasons. One, I've had this running for about oh, 1,400 cycles. No problems. It just, it runs. All it does is it generates heat. All you have to do is keep the uranium flowing every so often, which is actually kind of easy. You don't have to deal with any byproducts like carbon dioxide or anything like that. And as well as that, look at the amount of rads it's generating up here. We're running a bunch of farms all the way around it, and it's just a nice, solid, stable supply of rads for our farms. At the same time, it does produce an awful lot of nuclear waste. Originally, that was a problem, but once you discover that you can compress it down and make yourself an absolutely ridiculous rad bowl generating system, yeah, uh, suddenly that nuclear waste seems more of a benefit than anything else. That ben that compressed nuclear waste, incredibly handy. If you were a newer player and you've never tackled any of the larger projects, this this could be one for you. Well, maybe not the double. This is a double I made. So it's basically the same reactor design as before, except it's just mirrored. And instead of going with five on each level, I went with three. And this is why this is a little bit too hot. You notice it's 207 degrees in here. So this thing is a little bit overheated. All the steam turbines are running a little bit flat out and it's not quite efficient enough. If I had to redo this, I would have made, well, I would have made some minor changes and made sure there was 10 steam turbines for every nuclear reactor. But assuming you're one of the newer players and you're looking for a nice big, nice late game project to get you, dig your teeth into, this one is excellent. It introduces you to heat mechanics, steam. Uh, you'll have to do a little bit of refinement of the uranium, of course, 
And as well as that, it's not like it's not sustainable long, long, long term. This is 1800 cycles in and we've got 20 tonnes of enriched uranium knocking about and a whole bunch more on some of the other planets. As well as that, if you go onto the star map, uh, there is, what is it, radioactive asteroid fields. So you can go out and get more uranium ore from there and bring it back. So yeah, and those are, uh, as far as I'm aware, they're infinitely replenishable, which means you can just run on uranium forever and ever and ever if you want. A nice big design like this will allow you to run about 18 kilowatts of power. That's a lot. Like down here, we're running about 13, we're using about 13 to f yeah, 13 kilowatts right about now. Maybe it oscillates up and down a bit. But we also have solar and a bunch of other things that are plugged into the grid. Yeah, yeah, they're they're probably using that thing uses like about 1200 watts of power. But uh, oh, one thing, if you are going to be putting farms around your your places, do remember that there's going to be a lot of rads there. Your troops will be spending time there harvesting and such like. So maybe put in one of these atmosphere talks that gives you the rad suits. Lead suits are the only way to really deal with rads long term. If you're only going to be dealing with them briefly per day, it's usually fine. Your dupes will go to the bathroom and get rid of 60 rads of exposure every day. But if you're going to be there long term, definitely can invest in the rad suits. Anyway, long story short, they're an awful lot of fun. You learn an awful lot about the game and doing them, and they're pretty handy, robust and stable. All the only downside to them is the actual technical requirement to get to them in terms of research. Barring that, they're excellent. Anyway, I'm going to cut this out here. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Good luck. Uh -huh.